uh, in the insulation on the pipe. But being at the location it was in, it was in the classroom, and the classroom is occupied. There's a lot of people coming and going. So we, we did take care of that issue. Okay, and, I guess my, my question is uh, with respect to the documents themselves. So they're, they're the governing guidance on, on what, you, what you assess and how you deal with findings and things like that is uh, uh, throughout the year and when you, when you do your six month assessments and three year retest, the documents themselves, are, are you responsible for maintaining um, those documents or, or is it someone else? And, and are those documents do up to documents. date? I'm actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll be sitting with Paul when I turn these reports over and see who actually hangs on to the material. But I do have a file set up for every building. So if it is my responsibility to take care of that paperwork, that'd be no problem. It would be on file in my office at the ad building for uh, anybody to take a look at if they desire. Uh, I can answer. I mean, I I can answer as far as the role, the role of yes, the responsibility is the operations department um, for maintaining these records. Mm -hmm. Mr. Copeland. Okay, thanks, Miss. Sure. So, so I guess where where I'm going with it is, uh, I heard a, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even a month ago now, that the uh, uh, Northeast Asbestos Management Plan, the doc, the governing document for compliance to the Here Act needed to be updated, not, not besides the severing of the building. Uh, my concern is that there's other uh, aspects of the plans in the other buildings that should be addressed as well in, in, those, in those plans. And I, I get that, I think, you're, I think you're referring to the records of the actual testing and things like that of the six month assessment and so on to maintain them and all the records of the material traceability and handling. Uh, I guess my concern is the the overarching plan for each building is are those up to date? And well, I'm not Mr. sure Paul, who to ask Paul, that question. I think, to. Paul, I think this is the time when you want to, you know we have specs. You need to speak. Can you speak about what we're doing with regards to all the specs? Yeah, Misty, uh, this is Rocco, Paul. Uh, guys, I'm on. I'm sorry. Okay. I I must have been on the wrong. I get so many Zoom invites. I clicked the wrong one. I'm sorry. Thanks, Rocco. And I do have a presentation if if I get a few minutes, but I have a nine o'clock uh, health department uh, training I have to jump off for. So I am here only until nine. Okay. So, I mean, uh, could Rocco or Paul, could one of you speak about the specs and the work that we're trying to put out for the summer? Yeah, let's talk, let's talk real briefly about the management plans first. Um, after the six month reassessments are done, yeah, those documents need to be updated. And we're gonna be working with Rocco's firm with, with Chicardi to get those documents updated. Just being that, it, you know, unfortunately we're at the point where we were almost starting from scratch. So every step of the way, we're kind of relying on our consulting firm at this point to make sure that we're not making additional uh, mistakes with our record keeping. Um, so yeah, I mean, like as work is being completed, all that's being documented, obviously our management plans need to be updated um, at this point for all the buildings being that he just finished his six month assessments. Um, and then Northeast is gonna have, you know, from all my conversations with uh, the, the gentleman at Chicardi that, um, that we're gonna have a new management plan for Northeast. But, uh, but Mr. Cobley, to answer your, your question, yeah, the management plans all need to be updated. That'll be done um, by Carl in conjunction with, with Kachardi. Um, that, being, that being said, I hope that answers that question. But, but, yeah, um, that, was, that was my explicit question. Thank, thank you very yeah, much. I'm sorry, I was sidetracked. I was trying to get Rocco on. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, around, uh, I, it was very important for him to be on. If Rocco, if I'm misspeaking, please speak he up. Yeah, and, and I apologize because I missed the front end of Rich's uh, question, but you're correct in that the, the management plans obviously are are contingent on where the asbestos is, uh, and that's really directed out of the three-year uh, reinspection process, and the inspection process drives then what is the management plan to uh, address and, and remediate uh, or control what's been identified and then the surveillance piece, the six month surveillance piece, which Carl is doing, is basically like a visual of just ensuring that during that three year period, 
somebody's looking at this stuff that we've known is asbestos because we've confirmed it on the reinspection and it's in good shape. There hasn't been damage. There hasn't been renovation or impact. So the, the way the system works, uh, it really is driven by the three-year reinspection, the development or updating as it normally is uh, of a management plan and then surveillance of that. So all of the management plans are going to need to be looked at, uh, at least from our uh, Paul, we've had this conversation. There's there's some additional sampling that we'll do during the reinspection process that I'm sure will eliminate, uh, just as it did in Northeast, a lot of uh, product that you guys, uh, building materials that you guys are assuming is asbestos, when no, in reality it probably isn't. That's what that's what kind of jumps. You know, after you pointed that out. That's what kind of jumps when you start reading these reports. There, there's items listed in all these management plans and reinspections that state that, like floor tile is assumed to be asbestos. And without actual sampling, how do you know? Um, like in our conversations that about uh, buildings like McNichols Plaza and West Intermediate, I mean, Rocco, and again, if I overstep, please stop me. But like, there's a chance we could do some testing in those buildings and have them essentially be um, uh, ACM free, almost oh, without not, a doubt. Also, not almost not needing a management plan, or to the point we don't need a management plan because the, they each have such little, uh, you know, items listed that, and it's assumed there, there there's a chance that's not asbestos, and they're asbestos free buildings. And we have management plans that we're that we you know we're doing for this in in our reinspection. So if we could actually have those buildings you know tested and sampled, um, and have them actually be identified as ACM free, that's that's huge for us. Oh, without a doubt, absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, great, great. So uh, I like what I'm hearing. Uh, uh, just a couple quick question follows ups to that. And then I want to get to uh, Mr. DiPietro before he has to leave. Uh, with the update for those plans, most of it's driven by the, the I believe most of the, the three-year assessments were in 2019, late 2019. Uh, so is there a timeline or a schedule to have all those plans updated? Or is it just kind of first in, first out, the best effort? Well, that's effort that's a doing? great question. We've had so many conversations about this because the way that that our previous consultant had been doing that was – um, almost like piecemeal, like they were not able to provide them all at the same time where I know just, you know, the learning process in doing this, most places have them do uh, the six month reassessments, January 1 and July 1. Well, Guzik was sending them to us anywhere from like even the reports that are dated like August of 19, we didn't receive that in August. We got that in September or early October. Um, but that they actually did the assessment in August. By the time we got the report, it was October, and they were just coming in, you know, a couple a week or one a week, and over a three month period. Our goal now, we did the six month assessment. Now we kind of did it piecemeal over the last, you know, three four weeks. But now our goal is we're going to get on that schedule. So the next six month assessment, it's not even going to be six month out. We're going to have them done for July one. And then the following year, we're going to have them done for January 1. So we have all of our facilities on that schedule, which is much easier to track. And then when we get up to the three-year assessment, then it'll be on that, you know, July 1 of 22. Um, I thought it was important for our, you know, for our district, just for tracking reasons, to have them all do simultaneously. Um, it, it makes it much easier, I think. That's the way everybody else does it, Paul. Yeah. So, so your intent is to have the plans updated by July 1st, and that will be the next uh, uh, set of assessments will come in at, at the same time? Oh, my, my plan is to actually talk to, like, Rocco and update our plans. Is, you know, Carl just finished up these six-month free assessments. We're going to start updating our plans now. But he's going to go through the six-month assessment process um, again prior to July 1 because okay. I want to get on that other schedule. So we're actually going to do another assessment within – like three months calling yeah. it a six month periodic check, which is, and it's not even really, but I'd, I'd prefer to get on that other schedule. Right. But this is a, uh, yeah, that would be, I a guess, big, I guess it's a firm right statement. Now, Go ahead. Came in within a three month time frame. reports have been coming in from, uh, from July until late October. 
and that's that's the reason for the the shuffle dates like you, uh, like you were talking about. But if we could get all the buildings on that six month schedule and they're all due and come in at the same time, that would be a, a big plus and would really help us get a handle on on everything going down the road. So that that's going to be a big uh, a big help when that comes along. So a long last uh, question I have with respect to this is um, I, I'm not sure of your jargon, but essentially I think you you the district purchased a uh, like a resource planning tool for like work orders and things like yeah. that. Yeah, is that going to be is that going to be tied into the six month and three year inspections as well? Well, we're going to put it in as like preventative maintenance scheduled, so people. Yeah. I mean, like Carl will get official notification that that's you know he needs to start working and when it's due. Absolutely. Um, in fact, we have another meeting. We have our introduction meeting for that operation system um, tomorrow, in fact. Um, but absolutely, that's going to be tied to it. All right. So those tasks from those plans will be integrated into that system. Okay, very yes. good. Yep. Okay, with, with that, and if there's no other questions with uh, regard to the uh, six-month assessments, uh, Mr. DiPietro, could you uh, I understand you have a presentation? As an update on Northeast? Uh, correct. Yeah, I have the uh, the uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully, uh, you're seeing it or will in a in a minute. Um, just got to work through uh, I mean, so many of these uh, Zoom things and Microsoft Teams and Skype. I got to figure out, remember which system I'm in. Uh, you got your screen. All right. Okay. So um, here's the update on uh, Northeast, which obviously is the central uh, project uh, occurring right now in the district. Uh, stuff in uh, kind of gray is uh, already been completed. Uh, happy to report that uh, as of April 8th, uh, the abatement in the auditorium has started. Um, that was a little bit uh, jazzed up uh, with the uh, Easter holiday and some time. So there was some prep before the holiday and, and they've now uh, uh, resumed operation there uh, as of uh, uh, early this week. So abatement is is ongoing. Um, word from it, our excuse technician. Me, excuse me, can, can yeah. everyone see the slides or are they, I, I just see the title slide on my screen. I'm not sure. Oh, you should see a picture of the auditorium, you know? No, no, I still have the, the cover sheet. Yeah, the front of the school. Okay, stand by. Be multiple monitors. Or... Yeah. There you go. That's better. Yeah. Okay, so you're not seeing what I'm seeing different way here. Okay. Yeah, I'll we're on, this yeah, we're on slide two right now. Okay. But you're seeing my whole PowerPoint screen, right? Correct. You're not seeing the presentation. Let me try this way. See what happens here. All right. Uh, okay, I'll work through it this way. Yep. No, I'm not fine. sure what's going on. Uh, maybe I have to close this one out. You're fine, really. I mean, that's. Okay. All right. So, uh, in regard to the. Uh, abatement uh, occurring. So the clean out is done. I can't remember when we met last time. We met on the first, right? So uh, it was that uh, Friday, so it would have been the third, that the clean out uh, has concluded. I have some pictures. It, it absolutely looks like a whole nother world down there. Um, we did identify a couple of uh, um, kind of additional waste streams that had to be addressed. There was a little bit of hazmat that we found uh, some, looks like some old uh, uh, photography or dark room chemicals buried a uh, couple of uh, jars of miscellaneous stuff. So that was addressed. Um, there was an e-waste stream, electronic waste stream <clears throat> that had to be addressed and segregated and recorded for the district. And then there was some, uh, you know, uh, individual student records that had to be addressed. But uh, bulk of the clean out um, uh, went into the dumpster. Uh, there was a little bit of reclamation of stuff that was kept. I think there were some stools and uh, art supply things that were of value. But uh, all that worked out really well on time, on budget. 
uh, Datum has uh, commenced as the abatement contractor. Um, the duct, their their uh, work scope of work is twofold in the auditorium room. And remember, this is underneath. Uh, one is to remove the asbestos. It's a mag uh, insulation uh, that goes around the entire duct, um, which you'll remember is you know maybe three feet <coughs> wide by two feet high. Uh, that's encased in in asbestos. Um, that's being removed as well as any pipe insulation or thermal systems insulation. So they basically have the entire room under negative pressure now and are abating. It seems to be coming off uh, fairly easily. Uh, so work is progressing pretty well there after a few days. They anticipate uh, sometime early next week to finish based on how it's coming off. So I think uh, kind of tentatively, a Tuesday, Wednesday-ish of next week, and then we'll do uh, here uh, aggressive air sampling down in there to clear the area. Right now, we're running samples outside of the work area, uh, as well as overseeing the abatement itself to make sure it's done in accordance with the HERA protocols. Once that work is is completed, <coughs> we'll call it the middle of, of next week, 22nd, 23rd-ish, uh, then uh, immediately following will be uh, uh, Harold uh, Newell from Scranton Electric and the HVAC guys, uh, which will go in there uh, for their scope of work, which is uh, really threefold. One is uh, to go back in and put in some dampers uh, that are in the duct that had to be removed, replace some filters uh, so that we can access the duct inside to remove any asbestos there. Uh, second is to uh, provide the supply ducting to the actual bells underneath the seats, uh, complete that duct work. Uh, and then lastly, uh, is to connect that intake uh, area in the, in the what, what Paul refers to affectionately as the fallout shelter, um, the duct room. Uh, and that will it, kind it of is a fallout shelter. I don't <laughs> refer to it. There's a sign outside of it that's fallout yeah. shelter. Yeah, I wouldn't go down there. <laughs> Uh, and I do this for a living, but uh, th that should should complete the uh, the work. And and again, I think that's kind of May ish. By the time they can complete all of that uh, activity, they need a, a few weeks of uh, fabbing and install. Even though the parts of this uh, duct are there. So, what's going on in the, in the meantime? Uh, is the approval process. Remember, this was a threefold uh, uh, process. One is to get the necessary approvals, uh, and that includes Scranton Fire from an occupancy standpoint. That letter has been sent to uh, uh, Looney, is it? Lonnie? Yeah. Lonnie, yes. Lonnie. Uh, for occupancy, we don't anticipate anything there. L licensing uh, and permits uh, from a building permit standpoint, to install the ductwork. I didn't talk to Scranton Electric, but I assume they um, uh, have received approval for that work. Uh, and then uh, the AHERA uh, issue with EPA, that letter is crafted and is currently being proofed right now. I assume the district will do a proof on it. And basically this is the concurrence letter that you've heard us refer to in the board meeting, whereby because we're uh, using an atypical adhera uh, methodology, uh, and it's it's that that's a subtle difference and one that we can exp expand on. But uh, we're separating the buildings, and that's really not a, a, an approved response action. We think it's it's protective of of student health and occupant health. It's just not identified as one of the things you can do. Uh, so we're asking for EPA to concur with this plan that says uh, we're going to separate the buildings, we're going to modify the management plan, uh, and we're going to address all of the asbestos in the, um, in the new side of the building and the auditorium. And we hope that you think this is acceptable and we're anticipating to get something back from the EPA that says, yes, uh, sounds like a good idea or something to that effect. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but that's that's the 
kind of key piece of this since the EPA is the authority having jurisdiction in terms of the asbestos side of the house. Um, and then from a Department of Ed standpoint, the PDE, um, all I think we need there is uh, to get the Scranton Fire guys to agree, to get the EPA to agree, and then they'll be satisfied that uh, we can resume occupancy. All of this obviously is done outside of the COVID-19 current uh, uh, issues, and, and we know we're not going to be back in that school uh, at least until at the earliest, uh, the end of summer, or maybe even longer. So uh, all of the timelines have kind of, you know, shifted a bit, uh, but we're still proceeding along the lines as though we want to try to reopen that uh, building as, as fast as, as possible. Now, Car uh, Rocco, if I may, the Scranton Fire Inspector Lonnie, he was on site. He did a walk through the facility. He did not see any issues with capacity. Um, we had walked through, geez, that's weeks ago now with him. Now, trying to get him to give us something in writing has not been as, uh, as easy as getting him on site to look at capacity. We did send a letter um, with our anticipated capacity. Now, Kachardi did do uh, the exact calculation based on square footage, and the building is, a, um, they calculate the capacity of the building as uh, 12 uh, 1,247, which is uh, would just on the newer side, the 1931 side, which would easily um, house the entire student population and the staff. Um, so that letter is with the city. I'll follow up again this week and see where they're at. Um, again, I think everything has a has a little delay or gets pushed to the side just because of the COVID-19, you know, things that everybody's dealing with. But uh, that was great news as far as the capacity calculation. That's something I was kind of holding my breath on. But um, with that number coming back, that's, you know, certainly more than enough to house the entire student population. Gotcha. Agreed. So so that's the plan. Um, moving forward, um, here's just some pictures. Um, hopefully you can see. Um, obviously, this is completely cleaned out of uh, any uh, debris. Um, there's no re remaining residual anything. Um, there are pipes, as you'll see in the top of this picture, that, that do still have asbestos on them. This was pre-abatement, uh, post-clean-out pictures. This is the infamous ball-out shelter, the duct room area on the left is the intake side of the house both for uh, the new side and the auditorium area to the right of that picture is the auditorium side our duct work that was shown here in this picture uh, basically connects those those two areas um, and now this is uh, kind of what it looks like today post uh, uh, prep for abatement so this is a three-stage decon uh, right outside of the abatement area so everything in this room or actually half of this room is under negative pressure being HEPA filtered while the guys are in there removing the asbestos off of the duct. And Rocco uh, I want to point out there's the fallout shelter sign. <laughs> yes there is there it is <laughs> right underneath the asbestos sign. Yeah. Yes so so Overall, uh, my report card on uh, on Northeast is this is moving along uh, pretty well. There's there's really uh, I, I can't be be critical of anything in the process. It, it's everything that we thought would happen is happening. Uh, it's happening on the schedule we anticipated, um, and and the money is what we thought it was. So there really has been no alterations to to the process and pretty happy with the the way this has been uh conducted and, and planned out um i think you did uh, the district a service by um separating this uh into two phases you saved i don't know paul ten fifteen thousand dollars uh in the process now granted we have some extra time uh which helped but realistically this is going as well as it as it could go uh, for for what we're in for and and at the end of the day we're going to have a, a really uh, solid and safe um, ventilation system uh, to to uh, present back to the children that that 
reoccupy that. So just kind of my commentary really well. Um, uh, really nothing I can, I can uh, change. And being um, able to use the auditorium as we get back into that building next fall, um, I think is going to be critical. I think that's really going to help the school having the use of the auditorium. Initially, we talked about getting back in that side and keeping the auditorium closed. And obviously that would have created some issues down underneath because of, you know, when they put in the structure, the ductwork. So it actually ended up working to the advantage of the school because now they have the access to the auditorium back. And, and, and Paul, we speak in, in health and safety world of a hierarchy of hazard control, right? So the first thing to control any hazard is eliminate it, followed by things like engineering and administrative and lastly, personal protective equipment, right? So think mm -hmm. of COVID, the best way is to avoid contact, right? Use telehealth and, and not go to the emergency room for miscellaneous stuff. The added benefit of this is that by the addition of the intake duct, you're not going to be able to get to the area underneath the auditorium very easily. You will be able to use the man door um, pictured here. So you will be able to literally walk through this door, come out the other side of this door and go back into that room, but it won't become a storage area again because uh, we're really limiting the access to that area. So we kind of engineered the, uh, it's an unintended consequence, but uh, it does prevent future problems from reoccurring and popping up there because they're just not going to be able to get to it. So um, the last thing uh, that Paul and I have talked about that we wanted to, I think, make the group aware of, and, and you guys had already started this discussion when I... Uh, so rudely jumped in late uh, to the meeting, but uh, it's the summer abatement plan. So Paul had worked with the previous um, environmental consultants uh, <clears throat> to develop a remediation plan for the summer. And I guess that work commenced in maybe January or- Yep, January, uh, January 13th. January 13th, so yep. before our involvement, and they, they packaged up uh, a variety of uh, uh, asbestos containing materials they wanted to remove over the course of the summer. Given the size of that, they uh, broke it up into five packages, uh, each designed to spend uh, or dedicate about 35 uh, man days uh, of activity, thinking that uh, each of those would be bid separately, they would be awarded separately, and you could concurrently run five projects uh, and get the work done in the prescribed amount of time. That includes work at 12 different schools. Uh, so Paul had shifted those over to us uh, last week and, and asked us to take a look at them, uh, to look at them in light of A, um, how realistic is this? And now with the governor essentially uh, shutting the schools down for the rest of the summer, does that give us an opportunity to have more time to do the work? And can we look at this in a different way? So we just started uh, parsing this uh, out uh, based on the old uh, reinspections that were done. Now keep in mind, uh, there's at least some inherent uh, issues with those inspections, things that just didn't make sense. Uh, and, and I think Carl's seeing some of that as he goes out to do his surveillance inspections. Um, combined with some of the uh, uh, the sampling that was done, uh, whereby things were assumed that maybe didn't need to be assumed, and we also have this, the the uh, abatements that have occurred since January. Most importantly, uh, the President's Day weekend abatement package uh, over Valentine's Day, where we did a a, a bunch of uh, abatement activity, uh, utilizing that downtime to get some. Uh, critical work done. So with that as an, an overlay, we're re-looking at those. Um, we come up with some of those numbers in the middle, about 250 separate work areas. And we look at it in terms of a work area uh, because uh, if you had 2,500 square feet uh, in one big uh, auditorium, it's a lot easier to abate as opposed to 10 areas of 250 square feet because of the setup required, the critical barriers, the decon, the clearance sampling that has to happen. So not, not all 
numbers equate to the same amount of work. But uh, just some rough numbers, over 400 fittings, uh, 17,000 linear feet of pipe insulation and, and almost 35,000 square feet of flooring, uh, either v uh, vinyl asbestos tile and or mastic um, or uh, sheet goods. So it's a monster uh, abatement uh, uh, plan to get all of that done. But given what we think uh, we're going to get from the reinspection process and, and the work that has been done, uh, and what we know of the district uh, after uh, a month or two of of uh, dealing with folks, uh, we think we can narrow that down into two or three packages. And, and what's the advantage of that? Well, uh, you get economies of scale. If you don't have to deal with five companies or five crews mobilizing and five sets of uh, contract documents and five sets of purchase orders and change orders, uh, you get some economies of scale and you can do things more efficiently uh, and and for a cost effective uh, manner so th there's advantages to to limiting the number of packages that you put out uh, so we, we haven't put this in um, a spec yet <clears throat> but it's going to take us a couple more days to get this all sorted out um, but that's what we think is we'll hope for two maybe a worst case scenario three packages uh, and then that work can commence uh, but really is as early as May uh, and you buy yourself uh, another four weeks uh, three or four weeks of time uh, to get uh, abatement done which again uh, can uh, lower your overall cost if you're not uh, squeezing these contractors to get a ton of work done in a short amount of time. They'll they'll quote it, but uh, they're going to whack you uh, pricing because they don't want to get hit with liquidated damages on the back end if school doesn't open on time. So um, it's it's a reasonable plan, uh, but it is absolutely an aggressive um, and sizable uh, plan to get all of that work done over the course of. Uh, the next couple months but that's yeah, kind of where our focus is as we move away from northeast uh we're moving into the summer abatement stuff because as obviously when if we if we end up abating you know thirty thousand square foot of, of tile we have to have a flooring contractor coming in immediately after that's abated to get in to get in new flooring so like we're gonna have to have this a lot of this summer abate work done by the end of july um just to get the pipe insulation in to get the flooring installed to make sure again like like you said Rocco to ensure that we're, we're starting school on time um, certainly we can't have any delays going back in the fall um, <clears throat> by our own by our own hand I'll say um, we have to be back in there on time when you look at that number 30,000 34,000 square foot of tile that's a monster flooring number um, in my mind I'm just doing it real quick if it's three dollars a square foot to get it and get it installed, you know, I'm I'm just looking. But I mean, it's really we're dealing with things that should have been addressed, you know, over the last over the last twenty years in in thirty years since you know since eighty eight. I mean, this this these improvements should have been happening, and and really we're kind of where we're at right now. But if we don't have that done by the end of July, and we have the whole month of August to get flooring in and to get get the pipes reinsulated. You know that's that's going to be the issue. So picking up, you know, as unfortunate as it is that the governor closed schools for the rest of the year, you know, the educator in me uh, that really hurts because I want I want the kids in school. You know, I want to be, you know, I want to be in schools. But maybe we could take this negative and make it somewhat of a positive because this gives us some extra time to get all this work accomplished. Got it. Well said, Paul. All right, so um, that's kind of my update. Uh, you know, the the rest of this uh, meeting, uh, Rich, I kind of just uh, leave to you to tell me what it is that I can do to be of assistance and helpful in the process. Again, um, you know, I know environmental issues are much bigger than just asbestos. Uh, you know, to include a host of other things, you let me know how I can be of uh, greatest assistance to you guys in this process if it's uh, from an, an educational standpoint because you want to understand 
rules or best practices in any of these areas. If you need uh, assessments, um, you tell me uh, kind of where I, where I can go to help you. But uh, I think, as I said the last time, uh, you guys are not alone in this in this uh, voyage of kind of being that um, environmental uh, perspective from a parent and, and student uh, standpoint. So you tell me what I can do to help and, and uh, I'm here to support you guys. Th thanks, for, thanks for the update. It looks like a lot of uh, good work has gone on at, uh, at Northeast there. Uh, do, do have a, just a couple questions. Um, the letter to the EPA, mm -hmm. have you, is that in the hands of the, the district now for review uh, or is that? No, it, it, as of uh, about uh, 7.45 this morning, it was back in my inbox. Uh, they've made some changes to it that we had recommended. We talked to Joe last night, we had a conference call. So it should be over to Missy. I would say, as uh, soon as I get off this one, finish my next one, say by lunchtime today. Okay, and then that, that uh, initiates the district's review and the, you know, the solicitor's review and things like that. Yeah, I, I didn't talk to Missy specifically, but I assume uh, Katie's gonna wanna take a look at it. Uh, it's written by Joe, but on behalf of uh, uh, Missy as the superintendent. So uh, I'm sure some folks are gonna wanna get a look at it, uh, but it, it's, it's mostly factual. It's very adhera driven. This isn't a kind of a, uh, feel good letter. Um, there is another one of those coming, but this is this is the very factual. Here's how we want to modify the uh, uh, management plan. We're going to separate the building. Here's the interconnections. Here's how we've addressed them, kind of deal. Uh, and we need your concurrence. So um, I, I would imagine a fairly quick review from the district standpoint. Okay. Thanks. And then. Uh... Have you guys been working on uh, updating the Northeast uh, management plan? Uh, we haven't done anything to management plans at this point. Uh, we've simply been working through the original management plan that exists. And at this point, um, kind of just uh, putting our notes in the margin, if you will, uh, waiting for that process, that uh, blessing to move forward with all of the management plan updates. So we know what has to happen once the EPA gives us approval, but at this point, there is no new management plan. And there's no uh, action to update that until uh, EPA approval? Uh, correct. Any other questions? With the... Uh, Summer abatement work, you, you referred to composing specifications or specs. Is, is that a, a, like a bidder specification? Uh, yeah, correct. There's, there's both uh, a, an administrative process uh, around each of these, given the size of them and the, the fact that they have to be publicly advertised and bids evaluated. And uh, so there's a kind of an administrative set of specs that go with it. And then there is a Kind of a technical set of specs that says this is how we're clearing this is the personal protective equipment uh this is the kind of submittals that you need to provide us prior to working uh, so it's uh, aia set of specs that uh, kind of get uh, adopted for each particular package based on the type of uh, material being removed now we're looking at at uh, kind of using the work that has already been done that the district paid uh, Guzik for, um, and wherever possible, we're going to, you know, keep that same language, uh, assuming minimally that the administrative stuff is correct from um, advertising and public opening standpoint. We may just need to tweak some of the actual materials that are included in the scope of work based on what we know has been altered, uh, abated, doesn't exist, isn't really a problem kind of stuff. Okay, and then given the, the magnitude of work across 12 schools, and, and um, I mean, it seems like that would require uh, some significant maybe uh, coordination, obviously, and, and is there a uh, prior, prioritization of the work that's gonna be done this summer? 
Uh, is, it, is that all kind of? Uh, I think that the prioritization, as I understand it, has already kind of been um, uh, taken into account by inclusion in these packages. So they've looked at kind of what's the uh, uh, total mass of asbestos at, say, uh, West Side High, and they've already parsed through that list and said these are the priority of uh, uh, abatements that we want to include in this package. So that overlay has already occurred. Uh, what we should be just confirming is the stuff that's in the summer abatement package. Uh, A, hasn't been addressed in some previous work since January, and B, really is as bad as they say it is. Um, so it will require an, another look-see, but I don't think it's going to be uh, massive. It's realistically uh, a couple hours of work at each of the buildings and and many of them are pretty small abatements it's you know the memorial stadium's got 15 fittings or uh, some of them are very small um, it's only a couple of them that are sizable uh, west side and uh, south scranton intermediate i think are the two uh, largest and and how those specs were developed and and i can speak to this just because i was in the meeting with with guzik is as they put these summer specs together, what they did is anything that had a removal priority of a four, three, two, or one went into those bid specifications. Now, a lot of the, the work we had done up through, I want to say mid to end of February was already removed from those summer packages. And, and you'll see that rock off. Um, so a lot of the work that Datum did is already out of those. Um, but that's, that was the initial plan. Anything with a removal priority of four, three, two, or one was going to be um, in those packages. So if we can actually get that all accomplished this summer, um, that would be huge. That would put our district in, in the scope of 12 months of where we were to where we could be, like, or where we'll be at. Is, it's like night and day night and day because that would only leave any you know really anything with a removal priority of a five six or seven which <clears> is much <throat> easily are much easier uh to manage than something that has a removal priority of a two um so that that was the idea behind the summer packages um to really target anything four three two one on removal priority and then uh, uh Paul, I'm, I'm assuming you're coordinating, uh, for, for example, you mentioned the flooring, like that, that abatement work would happen earlier so you'd have time to you know, do whatever follow on, you know, non abatement type flooring installation and all, and all that. It's, it's a, sounds like it's going to require some serious project management. Oh, it, it's going to need some project management. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, you know, we'll engage Kachardi to oversee uh, the bid process, not just to review the specs, but to oversee the bid process that they'll evaluate the bids come in. Obviously, they're the experts in that. But as soon as we get those scopes of work, now we're going to have to also get out, um, get out bids for our flooring because we need somebody that's going to, we got to award that early enough that the, whoever is going to get those or get those, it'll probably be multiple companies. Again, we're going to have to break those packages out because they need to order in enough time to make sure they have them in stock so they're ready to go and they have a schedule you know, in, in, in early August. Uh, the flooring does go down quick, but we certainly aren't gonna be able to wait for them to order it um, in early August. But yeah, there's gonna be a lot of uh, coordination that, that needs to be going on. And that's really the operations department. That's gonna be the whole focus of the summer. I mean, other than you know, the building level people are making sure the buildings are clean for the start of school. But as far as the operations department, it's going to be totally focused on, on this summer abatement work and making sure that everything runs smoothly. Great. Thanks. Uh, okay. Is there any, uh, uh, sorry, Rich, I just, uh, before no, I bow out, I just wanted to see if there were any questions for me before I have to leave. Rocco, thank you very much. You're welcome, and I, I know Jenny will do a set of minutes, but if, uh, if there is anything uh, in the meantime you need, just give me a, a quick shout, send me an email or something, and I'll try, but I'm gonna be in training, doing training, so I won't be uh, able to monitor that for the next couple hours. So, so Rocco, uh, thank you, and before you go, just to plant the seed, um, uh, 
uh, depending on what the rest of the task force here's thoughts are. But uh, to me, it sounds like we've, we're starting to get a handle on the uh, uh, asbestos uh, issues, including Northeast and the plans and the assessments going forward. Uh, perhaps, uh, and my intent is to reconvene a month from now, uh, if, the, if everyone agrees with that. But uh, I think at that time, I personally would like to expand into uh, uh, other topics. And uh, if you could consider uh, maybe putting together a briefing, I know the district's had some mold issues in the past with respect to air quality. That'd be something I personally would be interested in to start to hear and understand what uh, provisions or procedures are in place to deal with that. That's I, awesome. I think that's a great idea because that's, yeah. um, one of the things I wanted to bring up today at the end, we were going to talk about some new businesses. I want to talk about um, Armstrong and our plan for the HVAC because we had so many mold issues and growth issues there over the last two summers. Um, and I want to, maybe we need to look at some wide scale testing in some of our buildings come the springtime. Um, I mean, we're getting in, in Rocco again, you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but you know, as we get into the spring, I guess that's probably the ideal time if we're going to do some some testing um, because we're going to get more accurate samples from the outdoor um, air samples as compared to indoor. Um, uh, correct, Paul. But but even before, because I'm not a, you know, go and, and just sample for sample sake guy. I, I'm much more concerned about the fact that these buildings are going to be unoccupied um, through the spring and we run the risk of you know, excessive humidity issues and yes. same thing we had in the summer maybe accelerates because they're not occupied and, and you know, somebody's idea is to save some money and, and uh, increase the temperature and, and decrease the HVAC operation and now we end up with a bloom and you have amplification of spores all over the place. So you're right, absolutely is the time to to be monitoring those systems now, not necessarily running air samples, but making sure we're controlling humidity, uh, particularly as we get to the warmer uh, time. But again, I'm I'm sorry, I have to I have to get going. All right. Just give me Thank a you. shout. Thanks, Thanks Rocco. Thank you, Rocco. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks. Okay, so with that, I think we've uh, we've covered uh, extensively the update on Northeast. Uh, we got a update on the six month asbestos inspections. Uh, again, looking for a, a wider environmental issues. Uh, uh, yeah, I that, mean, if, uh, if can I you could follow talk, up with Rock, go go for it. Yeah, yeah if it, it, I, I yesterday I met with uh, David Johns, who's an engineer with uh, Greenman Peterson GPI. At the last board meeting, um, we did award an engineering contract to GPI, which I was thrilled about. So we do have a new engineer of record. So we wanted to jump on a couple big projects that we've been waiting for an engineering solution on. One of them being um, the Armstrong HVAC situation. The last two summers, we've had significant mold growth in that building. In fact, like the week before or two weeks before school last summer, we remediated every single classroom um, in that building. And as it turns out that, it, you know, there was there was some issues with uh, with the energy savings contract and the contract that did some work. Now that's that's being dealt with legally um, with our solicitor and uh, some other agencies. But we need a solution to the HVAC issue there because the humidity got so out of control. Some of the rooms had building humidities up there of like 90%. It was like a thunderstorm and, and really it boiled down to that we need significant HVAC upgrades there. Um, so we, I had uh, GPI up there. They're going to come up with uh, a solution that, you know, obviously they're going to do a study. I got to put that in front of the school board for their approval. Um, but we've been dealing with this for a couple of years that I, I'm sure that they're going to want a solution to this also. Um, but hopefully again, with maybe with the extended time and not being in school, maybe we could get a jump on this. So yesterday I met with David Johns from GPI. I met with Harold Newell from Scranton electric. We actually uh, kept 10 feet away from each other, but did a walkthrough up at Armstrong 
uh, with Carl. Carl was there also, but so we're hoping to have a solution, uh, a permanent solution to that environmental issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that they're also going to be involved, and I'm not sure if this is an environmental issue, but I thought I figured I'd throw it out there that GPI is also now going to be working on an engineering solution for our sprinkler system at Scranton High School. So if the people feel this is not an, uh, an environmental issue, please, um, I'll stop. But they're going to be working on a solution for the sprinkler system issue at Scranton High. And uh, later today, we get to pick up, uh, we had ordered 3,000 disposable masks for our maintenance workers, and uh, they're in. And Carl, you can hear this right now, you get to pick them up today. <laughs> um, I got you. Uh, but so we, when our maintenance staff does get back to work, um, currently they're not working. Uh, because our buildings are not occupied and uh, but hope we hope to get them back to work hopefully within the next week or so uh, they'll be properly protected and uh, have masks available disposable masks uh, so that I think that was you know something that's that they were looking for before they return and understandably so um, so that's where we're at uh, and that's that's the updates I have I think last we met too, we discussed uh, some, um, I guess, procedural or like checklist items for when the buildings are like over uh, Christmas vacation and things like that. Where yep, I uh, you actually, go and run the water and do things. I like issued that. all those. Um, our district, is, we do use the the Google Suite, so all of our administrators, all of our, all of, in fact, every staff member has a Google Calendar. Um, so I did put in everybody's Google Calendar, all the preventative maintenance for uh, the filters. So they get, you know, the month before they're due, they get an alert. The uh, 15 days before they're due, they get an alert. The week before they're due, they get an alert. The, week, the day before they have to be installed, they get an alert. Um, so that's happening quarterly. And also they get the same kind of alerts to make sure they're flushing all of the faucets and uh, uh, fountains each month so the same kind of alert so whether they want to get the alert or not it's it's going it's going right to their devices um so at least they're you know they're obviously responsible for ordering the filters that they need for the for the hvac systems but they're going to be getting so many alerts on it that uh i don't know how they could possibly ignore it um what will help dramatically is implementing our operations system you know they're for as long as you know as i can tell operate the operation system in our district has kind of been operating as oh, if somebody needs something they'll call and, and, and it really wasn't creating a, a situation where you were able to do any type of preventative maintenance that the record keeping was as spot on as it should be um, by implementing a, a work order management system and a preventative maintenance system it's going to tie back to all our POs. It's going to create a documentation stream, which is long overdue, especially considering, you know, really our district is a business, a business of this size, $160 million budget. Um, we have to make sure that our documents are square and all our record keeping is on point. Um, we did have one implemented the, the solution we're using. It's called uh, the company's called dude solutions asset essentials by dude solutions. They were formerly called School Dude. Um, it was, uh, there's over 200 school districts in Pennsylvania that use this platform. And it is, it's everything I think that we're going to need it to be. They have so many options for their, you know, to use through their system. But if we could get it up just to manage our work orders and manage our, the preventative maintenance pieces that we're aware of, that's going to be, that's going to take us light years beyond of where this district has been for, for decades. Um, so we have another implementation meeting tomorrow. We hope to be rolling that out to our staff um, operationally, like have it up and running for July 1, but do some training prior to that. And the training's all virtual and it's, it's pretty much, you know, point and play. Like it's, it's, it's plug and play. Um, there's apps for phones and there's apps for iPads that people will have the ability to submit a work order where they get a response as to, yes, it was received and yes, it's assigned to this person and yes, it's complete. And it's going to create, you know, basically it's going to hold people accountable for making sure that that work's getting done. So that's going to be critical for us. Um, 
but uh, I'm glad you brought up about the preventative maintenance piece because I did populate everybody's Google calendar. They're probably going to get sick of hearing from it because it's going to have so many alerts going off, but thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that, that's good. To, good to hear. Um, so the, the Google is a stopgap until you get to the, uh, yep. the planning Absolutely. tool. Right? And, so and, and once great. we get the other one operational, we're not stopping the Google. I'll leave it in there. I set it up into perpetuity. They're going to get those alerts in their <laughs> Google calendar forever. Okay. Uh, any, any other comments? Uh, Rick, the only thing I, I want to mention, this is for Paul. I think Rocco made a very good point, Paul, about uh, specifically Armstrong and the shutting down of the building and cost savings. And I think that's something that's going to come from my colleagues and being prepared with information like that, you know, about how these buildings, even though they are unoccupied, do need to be maintained and sustained so we're not making more of a problem. Uh, yeah, we just... I, I was I, I was talking with Missy earlier and Carl and I met yesterday and we were talking yesterday. I mean, we want to get our buildings. We want to get our maintenance staff back into our buildings. And obviously we have to do that safely. Yeah. Um, so like a, like the, I would think the smaller buildings, we can do that because there's going to be less than 10 people, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, a building like Scranton High <laughs> has more than 10 maintenance workers assigned to it. So right. I don't know if we could bring them all back or if that would violate the governor's order or do we bring Scranton High back to two shifts, which we can do. Okay. Um, so we're going to have that conversation actually later this morning about how to move ahead with that because, um, you know, and Carl brings up excellent points that uh, like he's like grass obviously still needs to be cut. We right. still obviously need to be in, you know, checking boilers and making sure our buildings are not going into disrepair because nobody's in there for weeks right. at a time. And that's right. a great, great point. We also talked about shutting off, obviously, all the, all the HVAC systems because, you know, essentially we're kind of through the time where things are going to freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, if, we're, if, if we shut off uh, like a building like Scranton High or a building like West Intermediate, then we're not circulating any air. Right. and our humidity could go through the roof right um, obviously our buildings like uh charles sumner where they don't have air and it's just heat well we turn that off every spring anyway because it's mm -hmm. no longer heating so it's not that as much of a big deal there as it is for those buildings that are climate controlled yeah. um so that's all discussion i'm glad rocco said that because yeah, we have to figure out what to do with <laughs> west intermediate with scranton high with with Whittier, with Kennedy, and these buildings that do have, you know, air conditioning, and, and the air conditioning really does control the humidity in those buildings. Thank you. The, la the last item I had on my agenda, and I don't think Director Hume was able to join us from what I see. Um, we had just mentioned last week how to, how to effectively uh, kind of communicate the proceedings of this task force. Um, I didn't see the minutes uh, posted on, on the on a website or anything like that. Does anyone have any information? Uh, Rick, the update was shared with the board. If the minutes are not on the um, environmental task force page on the website, we can sure, certainly make sure that happens. And then, would there be uh, any concern with posting? Uh, the presentations from uh, uh, Kachardi and Associates as well? No, none at all. I have no, no problem getting that posted. Okay. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I'm just noticing on this, on our Zoom here that this is being recorded. Um, I'm guessing that Jenny is recording it. I mean, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care if we put a link to the recording. I mean, if people wanted to listen to the meeting, I, I also don't have an issue with that. Yeah. That uh, per policy, Paul, that would be up to this committee. Um, the community advisory committees are not open to the public unless the committee decides that's a way they want to go. So that would be up to all of you. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> I love a good policy. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, but I could I could easily make sure that the minutes get posted and that the Kachardi presentation gets posted. I'll work with Jenny to to get that done. Great, thank you. I think I think that would be helpful if anyone's interested in seeing what's going on. Sure, uh, for sure. Um, so any anyone else have any any other comments uh, before we try to set some items for the next meeting? This is Paul Medor. I uh, you know I was listening to him talking about. I think Paul Doherty was talking about the flooring in uh, Northeast, roughly 30,000 square feet. And, uh, you know, the cost of having that ripped out. And my question is, you know, in my experience, it's not necessary to rip it out. Is there, are we, are we definitely ripping it out? I mean, there, there are alternatives. It can be covered with epoxy if it's in reasonably good shape. It can be co covered and encapsulated in epoxy at, a, at quite a sig significant difference in cost. But I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if there's some new regulation because a hair used to, as far as I know, even in school buildings, allow that. Yeah, we, we're allowed to encapsulate things. That's something I'm going to kind of rely on the expertise of, of Rocco and, and, and Michael and Dr. Kachardi. Um, because I just think that they're, well, I don't think, I know that their knowledge and, and expertise on this far exceeds mine. So if they're going to, that's why they're reviewing those, uh, the Guzik specifications before we issue them. Because if they're going to go through and say, hey, we can encapsulate this, or hey, this is not in bad shape, you don't have to do anything to it. Because if, if the floor tile isn't, you know, isn't cracked, Obviously, even if it's asbestos floor tile, you don't have to remove it. Um, this was totally based off, you know, Guzik's three-year reassessment. Um, but if it had a removal priority of, of four, three, two, or one, so all of the, the tile that's listed there has a removal priority of, of at least a four, um, a four, I'm guessing a four or a three. So that's why they're going to spend a couple hours in each building just to take a look before we issue those bids. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to get those bid packages out you know, as soon as the governor said, hey, we're closed for the year, my first instinct was like, let's get these bid today. Yeah. And then um, Rocco was like, hold up. We just picked up an extra month. We don't need five. We could probably get it down to two or three and let us put eyes on, on some of these bigger items because you're looking at 30,000 square foot of floor tile across the district. That's a massive number. Yeah. Um, so they're going to actually go through and, and look at that stuff. And, you know, if they say, hey, we can encapsulate it or, hey, we only need to re remove five tiles, not, you know, 1,200 square feet in a classroom, um, that's a big, you know, obviously that's going to be a big change um, financially, but also to the timeline. Because if we don't have to start removing flooring, we're going to also save time, which, that's you know, is picking up four extra weeks seems like a big deal. But when we start thinking about all the things that has to be coordinated, it's got to go pretty smooth to make sure we're ready to go because we also have to leave time for staff to get into the buildings to get classrooms ready because they would not have been in there since March. I understand. It's you just, it just, it's just, you know, in my opinion, in my experience, it's the savings in money and time. I mean, ripping out, ripping out the tile is very, very expensive. It's you, you, you know, it, it's, it's got to go to it's asbestos containing. Right, you correct. Have to clean up all the barriers and do all that work, and then have to do all the cleanup even after it's done. It's the 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 cost of that are. are yeah, like we, I mean, I, I just it, it's 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 got to be a, a crazy number higher than encapsulation. I would I would think so. I would I would think you're spot on with that. I know they removed. No doubt. I I, I know they removed about eighteen thousand square foot of floor tile from northeast already and we got lucky because underneath it uh was the original like the original oak floors that were not in bad shape uh we thought we were gonna have to replace it and it turned out to be no not bad so at some point i would guess in the in the 50s 60s or 70s they decided hey let's cover the the oak floors with with asbestos tile but uh we got lucky on that side that when we pulled it up it was original hardwood underneath it. Well, um, that, that, that hardwood flooring can be epoxied too. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we redid them. Great. Yeah, 
At Northeast, yeah. we, re- we redid the hardwood floors. I was like, I'm not going to put vinyl on top of beautiful hardwood. That's, that's, that was, I was like, there's no way. If you found this underneath the, the flooring in your house, you'd be excited. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, but again, I'm going to kind of rely on, on what Charity's going to kind of point us in the right direction. Yeah, well, we, I'm just looking at it from cost savings, you know. No, I, believe me, I appreciate that because nobody's watching that closer than me because um, we don't have a ton in, in, you know, in, in repair money. And I'm kind of watching every dime. Um, so far, the, the total asbestos cost has not been anywhere near what I thought it was going to be, um, which is a good thing. But, it, you know, I, I'm watching every dime because our capital improvement money, we don't have a ton of it. Mm-hmm. But thank you very much. That's, that's an excellent point. That is, that's a great point. And you're absolutely right. That process would be a, a lot cheaper than uh, ripping out. And there's many different types of encapsulation and covering the floor with a uh, Luan or, or something like that is uh, that that's one uh, form of encapsulation. So that could definitely work. There's no doubt. Yeah, Epoxy is the way to go. But anyway, um, I didn't know if we had, uh, you know, in the March 7th letter, we talked about things that the, the forming of this, this committee, and we have talked about our, our mission, our vision, our, you know, what, what, our, what, what we're doing. And I, I, don't, I don't know if we've developed that. And I'm, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot because uh, I just want to know where, we, you know, I'd like the roadmap <laughs> of, mm-hmm. of, of where we're going from here with what we're, what our intentions are. Yes. So, so this is uh, Rick Cobley again. Uh, so the, the, my understanding and, and what the school district put forth when they, when they set this up, it was a, the, the statement they put out was a, it's the goal of this task force to learn more about the uh, current lead and asbestos conditions. And I think where we're heading is beyond that. And, uh, you know, just trying to, you know, essentially plagiarizing with the, the uh, referenced, Charlie referenced this in, to some EPA material. Uh, I'd consider uh, looking at what they have and their, their general uh, goal is to uh, establish and, ha- and enhance uh, healthy school environments. And, and they list a series of topics with, which uh, I, I kind of envision of the roadmap leading to some prioritization of those topics of which asbestos is one, mold, cleaning, chemical management, things like that, lead, lead yeah, along that's those lines. Thing, yeah. yeah, that's one thing we didn't even jump into yet is the lead. I mean, our solution thus far has been just turn off the, you know, the, the fixtures that have tested high. Um, whereas if we start flushing and we do some additional testing, we might just be able to switch out a couple fixtures and address it. Um, but we've been totally preoccupied with getting the, you know, asbestos under control that like our solution thus far from the lead is not a long-term one. It's just short-term. We have them turned off. Well, uh, with lead, you need, to, you need to find out if it's coming into the school or if it's in the school. Correct. Right. And, 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 and the only, if it's in the school, you don't need to replace the pipe. You need to install filters that remove that. And then you, you put in a, a maintenance you know, periodic maintenance to replace those filters for, for whatever drinking requirements there are. Right. You know, what, what we found with the lead is really the, where the areas we've not had a whole building test high for lead. It's only individual fixtures. And when we do 30 second flush tests, a lot of the ones that were tested high on the first draw did not test high after the 30 second flush which kind of tells us it's probably the fixture itself. Um, now, obviously, I'm not an expert. I can't say that, but just kind of putting two and two together, that's what jumps at me. But as soon as we get these summer packages out, that's going to be the next thing for Kachardi is like, hey, let's get a plan together for ensuring that if we start swapping out fixtures that we're doing the right thing. Um, you know, because if, if we could avoid doing whole building filtration, I would uh, – much prefer doing that um, just because I don't think it is whole buildings. I mean, not our testing does not show that. Uh, but that's, you know, that kind of got put on the back burner a little bit just because we got a temporary solution just by turning off the ones that tested high. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're right. There is not an entire building that tested uh, positive for, for lead. So no, it's sporadic throughout the building. Yeah, and, and the fixtures, uh, the fixtures that tested is, is, yeah. is a cheap way to start. The fixtures that tested high basically were in areas that we don't use all that often. That's correct. The water is sitting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In some cases, yeah. And by so, changing some filters and implementing a flush program at uh, the first of every month, I think you're going to see a, a big difference in, in the results of some of these tests because now the water is moving, we're flushing, it's not laying in these pipes uh, or laying in these fixtures. So uh, I think you're going to see that the lead problem is not as crazy as, as we once might have thought. And by just changing a handful of fixtures and stuff like that, I think you're going to see a big difference and a big turnaround in that. That's, that's the goal. I mean, when I talked to Rocco about this um, initially, he's like, well, how many fixtures, you know, how many tested high? I said, well, we had 38. And he was like, in one building? And I said, no, 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 district wide. He goes, oh, you don't have a lead problem. You have a fixture problem. Yeah. No, <laughs> I started right. laughing. I said, yeah. like, at the point, that was like in mid-February in the midst of our, um, you know, asbestos was in the paper every day. I started laughing. I said, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but that's the best news I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we don't have right um, and when you have a district our size with 19 buildings and you consider all the water that runs through these buildings having 38 issues is really not a a big deal so, yeah as long as you as young as you're not the one trying to get a drink of water at the fountain pardon me i i lost you there as long as you're not the one trying to get a drink at the fountain you know, it, my kids go to Armstrong, and well, my, my daughter does, and they, they can't even wash their hands in the sink because it's been tested for lead. There isn't a sign on the sink that says that. The water's just been turned off. It has been. And, Paul, that's what Paul was just talking about. In order for, uh, for and I hope I'm not speaking out of line, speaking for everybody, but my thought was uh, in order for us to – be uh, sure and assured that everyone in that building is safe. We went the extra step of turning all of the, the sinks off. So no kid walked up to a sink uh, unconsciously and, and took a drink of water when no one uh, was there to tell them, hey, drink out of the cooler, don't drink out of that water or out of that sink. So we just took it a step further to turn them, uh, them sinks and fountains right off so that scenario could never play out. And like how Paul, like Paul had said, that was an extra step in caution that, that, that we took to do that. No, that's also, but that's also on our, our, our summer work list is to get a permanent solution to that. Right. Um, and unfortunately, that, like we, we found a, a, a quick temporary solution, just turning it off. Why our uh, a focus was needed on other environmental issues. But now that things are kind of, I, I guess, we kinda have lovely. much a little, better. Yeah. Yeah, much better handle on 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 what's going on. Now we could focus back on that on that issue. Exactly. So, so from a short term roadmap for this task force, is is lead a higher priority than mold, or or, or is the mold specifically the issue at Armstrong a higher priority? Um, I would than have the, uh, lead fixtures. It would be a, a higher priority uh, because when you get into the cleaning up all of that mold and stuff like that, you're looking at scouring that in, entire building and uh, bringing in an outside service that costs uh, quite a bit of money. And if you know, that mold issue isn't taken care of, there could be a point at some point where mold takes over that, that entire building. Like Paul had said last year when we were up there uh, working on the mold issues, some of the humidity levels in those rooms were above 90 percent and was that, that after the, taking place inside of a building that's crazy carl i'm sorry was that after they cleaned the rugs pardon me was that after they cleaned the rugs no was that was uh like in no the, in that the, was right i can tell you that was july i think four, that was like mid-july right around july 13th or 14th that um that was the first day i actually had worked in central office that uh 
Dr. Kieran, the superintendent at the time, just said, oh, I just got a call from Armstrong. Go over there and see what's going on. I went there with, uh, I called Damage Control. A gentleman that works for Damage Control, Jeff Screewell, met me up there, and he had a, a device to measure humidity. Mm-hmm. We walked in. You could see growth in one of the rooms at that point. I mean, it was all over the place. Mm-hmm. We walked down to another classroom, and he had a reading on uh, a humidity reading of 92%. Um, at the once the rooms got remediated um that no that was not the issue we ended up uh you know there was issues in the hvac system there was water issues in the hvac system uh with the water valves and once we you know kind of shut the system off and got it and we were able to control the humidity a little bit no that was not the case after the rooms had been done okay. um but uh, it was bad when we went up there mid-July and that was two summers in a row. The same thing happened the previous summer and they didn't address any of the HVAC concerns. And then again, this past summer, same thing. Uh, now there is no more carpet. It was, the growth was all on the carpet in the, in, I think it ended up being eight classrooms last summer. Um, right. Yep. Yeah. But they, we ended up ripping the carpet out of every single classroom in that building it, it, you know dr finan came in probably i want i want to say a week or two before we went back she said she said absolutely every room needs to be done get the carpet out get new vinyl flooring in um and let's you know and let's move forward and we were able to do that um and the, hopefully that's going to make a big improvement but i mean the the next step to that obviously is getting the getting the hvac completely and permanently addressed with you know we had gpi on site yesterday starting that process but i mean i think if mr copley to answer your concern the the most important between lead and mold i i think it depends on on the building i think that you know one of the things we hear from um staff members a lot is about indoor air quality and making sure that there's good indoor air quality which obviously is critically important for everybody but i i don't know the answer to that i think that we would need to rely on Kachardi about, you know, where mold testing needs to occur because it's not always visible, I guess, you know, when it, when it tests high for lead, we know there's an issue and we can address that, but I don't, you know, we were able to see the mold at Armstrong just because it got so extensive. But I think that, uh, you know, I think it depends on the facility and I think it depends on what our consultants, Kachardi tells us we should kind of focus on at this point. And I think it also, you know, is open for discussion in this, in this committee. I, I, I think that's one of the values that this committee brings um, because we have, you know, we have people, you know, from the community, we have parents, we have board members, we have administrators, we have, um, you know, maintenance workers. And I think that, as a committee, we could kind of figure where our focus needs to go. So, so with, with that, um, I'd move that we, you know, shift to the mold issue next. It sounds like that, in my opinion, would be um, the most concerning to the broader community, uh, specifically the issues at Armstrong um, in particular. Uh, so, so with that, is it reasonable to uh, ask uh, uh, Kachardi and Associates to put some sort of, you know, they've got a little bit, of, to put something together to educate us a little bit on mold for next month? Sure, definitely. And then, uh, and then and hopefully, hopefully next month too, I'll have the, um, we'll, we would have taken some action on the study for, um, for GPI, because GPI is starting now to work on a, on a plan for Armstrong. So, I mean, that, you know, I'll gladly share okay. that information as well. And then you mentioned the Scranton High sprinklers. Is, is that, uh, are they leaking? I'm, I'm not familiar with the, I've heard some grumblings about it, but is that like a mold issue too down there? Or is it just no, it's a not a mold functionality issue, type issue? It's a functionality issue. I mean, the sprinkler system works. Um, it just leaks. Like we have, we have joints in the sprinkler system that are deteriorating. Um, We've done, now the sprinkler system, as you can imagine, in that building is massive. Um, we've done, I want to say at this point, I want to say probably in the neighborhood of, in, in, you know, don't hold me to this one, but I want to say probably in the neighborhood between sixty and $70,000 of emergency fixes just because of leaks. And trying to get a solution, like a long-term, what is the scope, 
what is the condition um it's it's a massive job uh you know the company that was doing the repairs for us k and k um fire systems they said oh well we'll give you a quote of not to exceed a quarter of a million dollars and we'll see how far that gets on repairs well you know we can't we can't just green light and, and sign a check for a quarter of a million dollars we need to know the scope of the work and really we need we kind of need an engineering solution on that piece you know i had asked quarter of a million jesus how much to repair the whole how much to replace the whole thing well that would be like 2.5 million so that's that's also not really a viable option and then we got into why is this system deteriorating um and and we kind of need a solution need to know there is it is there uh an issue inside the pipes is it outside the pipes is it due to um you know is it worse around the pool area like that they're all the kind of questions we need answered now we keep bringing in k and k to do to making sure the system's operational and to repair when we do get some leaks but uh it's really not, it's a functional issue. I don't know how much of it is an environmental issue. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up uh, in case it is environmental or if anybody sees it that way. But uh, we just need, a, again, a long-term solution to this issue. Uh, it's been in the, it was in the paper, I want to say last summer. But uh, we make sure it's functional. But uh, we need a longer solution than just repairing as it starts to leak. Because although it's not a mold issue right now, if it keeps leaking, it certainly could be. Yeah, so, so if that's the case, I'd suggest we table that for, for this form here, uh, unless it becomes you know, some, some secondary mold issue or whatever may result from the leaks uh, moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. All right, so, so, so with that, uh, attempt to uh, steer, steer the group here uh, and again please any anybody uh, jump in with any comments uh, I, I'd suggest we uh, look to uh, form an agenda for for next month and, and again I, I'm thinking with the, the current uh, situation with COVID-19 that uh, it'd be appropriate to to meet 30 days from now everybody okay with that yeah I, I completely agree I think we will have and I think we'll have lots of information to share at that point um, because I think our summer bid packages will be out. I think we could talk about those. I think that we'll have a, you know, I think we'll have a much better understanding of where we are at Northeast in regards to EPA mm -hmm. concerns and just the overall scope of work. I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be completely uh, like we're going to be ready on our end as far as work at Northeast. And I think that we're going to have some, you know, answers uh, as far as Armstrong. I think a month out is a great, is a great timeline. Okay, so um, so as as far as agenda items, not not necessarily in any particular order. Uh, we'll get an update on uh, any uh, northeast. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you could speak to the progress on the uh, management plan updates as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, Carl could. Yeah, Carl could definitely give us an update on that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That'd be great. And then, uh, Mr. Doherty, could could you uh, engage? Uh, Kachardi to put together some sort of presentation for uh, like a, the mold overview. Sure. Over, like an, an overarching uh, picture of you know, these are the air quality issues that result from mold, blah, blah, blah. Sure. But just to educate us. And then uh, I'm guessing at that point, uh, Mr. Doherty as well, you may have some updates on um, the Armstrong issues and the G GPI, I believe is the firm. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, what, their, what their plan is. Uh, perhaps a also, the last thing would be a, uh, uh, a status on any uh, tech home provisions, but any PM type activities or, or issues from an operations or maintenance standpoint due to the extended shutdown of the buildings Sure. Uh, as well. Yeah, uh, I think that's, I think they're all things that, that are going to be, they're going to be on our radar anyway. I'll be happy to speak to that. Okay. And then I'll, I'll take an action to attempt to put a slide together and try to get it on this platform of hey here, here's our short-term roadmap and a, a proposed long-term roadmap and I, really i think the short term is we've got the you know the fire in front of us with the asbestos and then the, the next closest uh issue is the mold but uh I'll, I'll put a quick slide together just to kind of highlight all the other potential topics you know moving forward as well 
Thank you. I appreciate you putting that together, that, that agenda. Okay. As far yes. as uh, – go, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Any, any other comments or feedback? I had a question regarding the management plans. It's Dan Walter. Um, it's probably more for Paul. Uh, Paul, you mentioned earlier, we may be able to eliminate buildings like West Intermediate, and I believe you said McNichols, from needing management plans because some of the ACMs were just, or most of them were assumed, not tested. Do we have a plan to test those buildings? Because it would seem to me if we could eliminate them from needing a plan, that's going to be a long-term savings. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, well we've, we've engaged, we've engaged Kachardi to do sampling in both of those buildings. Uh, like some of them, it just says like, obviously under, it'll say like mastic assumed. Well, we have to test the mastic. I mean, that's, um, and if we could, I mean, Kachardi is very confident that we can make them ACM free buildings and not need a management plan there at all. I mean, that's, that's big. Good. That's big in regards to even doing everyday maintenance items so then if a tile cracks and we have to repair some tiles if it's ac if it's found to be acm free like there's no big deal replace the tile you know like right. it's yes. some of the things that go along with the you know all the precautions you don't need exactly i would have, any building that we could get off of that list would be a would be a huge benefit to us huge yes, absolutely huge yes it would no doubt Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so, so uh, with that, Ms. Mrs. Orr, could you uh, please schedule a meeting for? Would it be May 13th? Uh, May 13th, yeah, that'd be a, a Wednesday. Eight o'clock is still good for everyone? Yes, that would be great. Yep. Hey, you got it. And then, and as, uh, as, as, as far as minutes for, for this meeting, um, I have taken extensive notes. I, I will uh, volunteer to type them up and uh, forward them out to uh, uh, Mrs. Orr to distribute to the team members here. That'd be great, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure, and, and anything else? Okay, with, with that, I think we're ready to adjourn. Um, Thanks, everybody. Thank you Have very much. Day. Thank you. Stay, stay healthy. Have a great yeah. day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank good you. Day. Thank you.